It's Wednesday once again, and it's time for Catalog and Cocktails. My name is Tim Gasper. I'm a longtime data nerd and product guy at Data.World, joined by Juan. Hey, Tim. I'm Juan Cicado, principal scientist here at Data.World, and it's Wednesday, middle of the week, uh, 4 p.m. Central. We're live and always uh, ready to take a break and chat about data. And uh, yeah. this week, we have a special guest and a special topic, a topic that I bring up a lot. And and like, why haven't we talked about this? And I'm super excited to be able to chat about data modeling and chat with Jans Osman, who's the CEO of Franz. And they're the makers of Allegro Graph. And those who know Franz, there's a large history around what Franz has been doing in the AI space for many, many decades. And he's a pioneer in AI and semantic technologies and graph databases. Jans, how are you? Welcome, I'm fine, Jans. thank you. Well, glad Doing to have well. you. We're, we're excited to have you here. So let's let's kick it off with our tell and toast. So what are you drinking and what are we toasting for? Uh, well, I'm drinking uh, maple syrup, old fashioned, with a uh, uh, well, the regular uh, you know uh, uh, bourbon and maple syrup and some bitters and that's my almost daily uh, drink so happy to do it oh, here nice although awesome. a little bit early here in in in, uh, in the san francisco bay area right but okay hey uh -huh. you know I, I, I like a little somewhere. maple in the old-fashioned that, that was yeah. actually my drink i think two weeks ago i did a maple rye old-fashioned oh well the best one i had in brooklyn where they also had smoked uh, smoked maple syrup with bacon bacon Ooh. bacon so Bacon Ooh. infused maple with syrup bacon. and then with smoke through it. That was the best cocktail I ever had in my life. But too much wow. work to have. I'm looking for bacon infused <laughs> maple syrup. If you guys have a point there, I would love to. <laughs> All right. Well, well, yeah, go. go look on Amazon. That's what yeah. I tried it. <laughs> it's hard, said. hard to find. Right. <laughs> How about you, Tim? What are you drinking today? Um, I am drinking a, a, a Sazerac. Uh, I have some absinthe, and and you know what? I, I don't have any cocktails that I ever use absinthe for. And so every once in a while, I'm like, I should have another Sazerac because you you know do the absinthe rinse. And this one I'm actually doing on the rocks. So that's my cocktail for today. Well, I had a bottle of white wine open. It was um, I forget. It was I think it was just a Sauvignon Blanc, and I had a little bit left of gin, and I had cucumbers. I'm like, I look up and I just made a white wine sangria slash gimlet with cucumbers oh, well, that's uh, nice. and then and there's lime in here so cheers what are we toasting for today cheers me oh well you always toast to the things that are nearest by to you right in, in close in your memory so my son just got married that's one i i just finished your book so uh <laughs> oh that's awesome <laughs> maybe, maybe you should toast your book um oh but actually i was kind of thinking to toast the artificial artificial intelligence at uh los fargo because this morning i got a phone call actually just before this uh this meeting here and that they had found a, a whole string of fraudulent transactions and they were asking me did you go to an in and out burger which we don't have where i work right and did you buy clothes at Nordstrom? No, I didn't. <laughs> so I had to cut up my, but I'm always so interested to see how that AI works, right? Because they hardly ever get it wrong. And then, and I do sometimes buy uh, something at an In-N-Out burger. So, I mean, not that weird, but love to see the, the algorithms behind that. Yeah, it's pretty oh. cool how often that so, works. So let right? me toast and, to the AI yeah. of El Fargo, right? <laughs> <laughs> cheers well, to all of that. Including well, cheers family. to all that. And cheers for, really, cheers. Thanks for buying the book and read about it. And reading, yeah. I'd love to go here and get your comments about it. So yeah. we have our, our warm up question of the day. If uh, you could be the top model for any product brand in the world, what would it be and why? Uh, well, it would be for Trek electric bikes. Hmm. And why? Well, I am, I'm Dutch and I had my first car when I was 28, right? I did it. I did everything on my bike, driving to work, to college, everything. And then finally I got a job too far away. I got in a car, gained way too many kilos, right? And then recently we moved from Oakland to a little town in uh, California called Lafayette. And it's about six miles from my home. I mean, we're on the top of a hill, so I didn't want to do it on a regular bike, but these electric bikes are fantastic, right? You still have to work hard, but at least 
you get your exercise and you can be outside in nature on your bike. So love, love my bike. <laughs> That's I'm cool. only, doing, only three weeks. I mean, we're just back in the office. By the way, that I've never been. been um, I've never been on an electric bike before. I've been on an electric scooter, right? Yeah, but never, never an electric bike. It seems kind of cool. This was a good propaganda for it. I need to go, go, go try one yeah. out. Then. Yeah. They How about you? Good Mark. modeling. How about you? Tim? <laughs> what What would you be the model for? Uh, so I was thinking uh, two potential answers here. One of them is uh, Tesla. Uh, because not because I would make Tesla look cool, but because it would make me look pretty cool. And could you imagine, like, you don't even have to drive the car. You can just kind of be like, right. Cause the car is just going to go by itself. Right. Um, the other answer I was thinking about had more to do with my day job. I was like, I could be the model for Atlassian for Jira. And I could be like, are you a product manager? Do you need to fill out lots of issue tickets? Well, I've got the project management software for you. <laughs> hey, there, there we go. At last, if you're listening, you just got a free ad right there. That was awesome. <laughs> I, I, my quick answer is, and I carry this all the time, is a Yeti. I love the Yetis. They're just really, hmm. they just, they're just, they're just cool. They just, I mean, I love them. Yeah, it's, it's robust. Just, they're, they're always they're robust. They always keep your water really cool, uh, cool um, and, and they look cool too. So, and I got my little sticker here. This is me, my sparkle tar. Me is a scientist, so. All right. Well, enough of this chit chat. Let's get into some real business here. And the honest, no BS question, you answer to kick off is why don't we talk about data modeling? Like, why don't you, why isn't data modeling a thing? Like, we talk about all this other stuff about data, but we never talk about data modeling. Why is that? Well, um, obviously, when we do projects for customers, <laughs> We always start with data modeling, but let me give you another answer. I'm a I'm a psychologist, right? I accidentally got into technology and became a CEO, but I'm I'm still at heart a psychologist. Read psychology literature all the time and deeply interested in cognitive science. And you have to imagine that when people make um, schemas for relational databases, right? Then oh, where are you guys gone? Then um, they it's very intelligent people that put these schemas together, right? But they don't really care about that other people can read the schemas, right? So they use abbreviations. Actually, it's this wonderfully well described in your book, by the way, Juan. Yeah, but all the ways people mess up the complexity of schemas. And so now people want a very easy method, yeah, to kind of untangle the craziness of the schema that people had in relational databases, right? But the problem is, there was so much intelligence that went human intelligence that was kind of most of the time undocumented went into making that schema and now people hope that there's an easy tool to untangle that again but you need the same amount of uh human intelligence to do that maybe even more yeah it's like reverse engineering sometimes especially if you don't know that new enterprise data warehouse that you suddenly have to get data out of so data modeling is very um uh, that, that's one of the things, you know, it's too complicated and you can't make it systematic. Then I taught data modeling. I mean, I did Jacobson object oriented software engineering I, when I was teaching at the university in Delft. Uh, I, I did that. And um, that's actually the most important modeling technology that I ever learned, right? Let's starting with the, 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 the models, who are the stakeholders, what is the use case, what is the interaction model, what is the, uh, the analytical model. And even now, when I help people that want to do modeling for and, and take the data that they have in their silos and put it into a knowledge graph, and they said, okay, the first thing I want you to do is take a really deep breath, yeah, and, and really, and, and forget all about Protege and Top 8 Composer, right? Just and an ontologies and all and all of that, yeah. If you are a software engineer and you did object-oriented software engineering, yeah, you've got everything you ever need, right? And then the other thing I don't do is ever start with top-down, very complex uh, uh, um, logical models. Basically, I f if if I'm doing a course or help a customer get into the modeling for their knowledge graph, for example, then I just ask them. In general, okay, what are the top 10 questions you want to answer with your new knowledge graph, right? Or with the system you're building. I 
I, I really find it terrible to see people that start building an ontology without knowing what the application is going to be, right? I mean, or the data model. The data model is always a function of the, the questions you want to answer. Uh, although I will get back to that later if you don't forget to ask me about that. But um, so I start by that and then I force people to just, to just write instance data on a whiteboard. Yeah, just how you intuitively think. So I, I, I take people and I let them do these instances and they find it usually very easy and a fun exercise to do, right? It's just a fun to say, okay, what, how would my model look like? And then I can help them a little bit to, um, but then just you get an initial model and then it's actually, in most cases, really easy to reverse engineer that into an ontology, right? And of course, you can use that same simple instance model also to see if the top 10 qu questions, I mean, they never get more than three, but if the top 10 questions actually can be answered with that model, right? And do I actually have the data in my silos that can do that? But I start always bottom up. What do you want to ask? What are the... How do you think the data could look like as instances, and then and then go up all the way up to the the, the formal model? And I think that's actually the way more logical way than is sometimes taught in universities, where you build this grandiose modeling thing, starting with a thing, right, and then <laughs> slowly slowly going can, down to a particular transaction object. Can you go into a little bit more detail when you mean what you mean when you say bottom up? Um. And, and, bottom up. And, and just to interrupt here and go ahead, there is we're now talking about bottom up and top down. So let's go describe. I want your definitions of bottom up modeling, top down modeling, and why the bottom up is the way you go, and why apparently you do not recommend top down. Okay, well, it's also something that comes up in. Uh, so I'm a I'm a a Lisp person, right? I mean, we have a Lisp company here, right? That <laughs> and we sell Lisp compilers. And there are some people that start with define function, you know, and then they do the top three steps and then they go to the first step and they make that in three steps, top down, really trying to make the tree. Whereas in what is way more natural is if you're in a particular domain, you you do tiny sub functions that you think you're going to need, right? And you try them out in your language. You can see if you can if the lower le lowest level functions actually will work. And then what Lispers do is you bu build like a domain language. You make a language that's very specific to um, the domain you're trying to solve. And then you can go back to the top level to express what you want to solve yeah, in that, in that sub-level, the domain language that you built, right? So it's like an interplay between bottom up and top down. So I'm not arguing against top down or bottom up. I'm just saying it's always this, this going back and forth between, okay, what happens at the lowest level and how do I look at it from the top down level? And how does that, but again, it's a, it's a human problem solving process, right? Doing it totally top down is only something that probably Java programmers can do, but. Um, so, so one of the things I hope, that I hope this, this <laughs> yeah, if you want to go to this discussion, I'd love to talk about this, but. Um, no, but this is interesting too. You're saying that the that if you're a programmer, not a Java programmer, you probably be thinking a uh, top down. But if you're thinking about just data and, and integrating data, then it looks like you'll be thinking about from bottom up. This is an interesting perspective. I never thought about it that well, way. Well, yeah. And the interplay between how a software developer thinks about sort of architecting this versus, you know, a data engineer or a data architect who yeah. you know you know top down being like oh like we're doing kimball Ma kimball ross or you know let me you know yeah. versus like a more of a bottoms up approach being you know sometimes something that's in structured data but but more often you see in the case of like semi-structured data right like where like yeah. lots of sort of documents are coming in and you're like oh like let's try this schema oh that didn't quite work let's try this instead you know it's it's interesting it one of the things that you're bringing up here is the common thread around all of this is people. And I think yeah. it seems it seems to me that we don't talk about data modeling that much because it involves humans and we want to automate everything. We want everything fast and, and putting humans is just going to think are going to make things slower and we won't agree. And so, so is, 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 is this 
do we just need to shift? Well, I do think we need to go shift. It's like we need to stop thinking that it's just pure technology and we can go automate things as fast as, and do things as fast as possible, that we need to be able to bring in humans and understand this balance. And data modeling is key to that. Data, you need a, data modeling is representing what we have in our brains. It's like that immaterial stuff. And I want to be able to somehow take that immaterial and make it material somewhat tangible. I think that's the process, and, and, and that's not easy. I guess that's why we don't do it because it's not easy. What do you uh, think? Well, that's what I started with, right? It's it's um, modeling is, is 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 human problem solving, right? With with everything that comes at human problem solving, part of it is symbolics, part of it is based on experience, part of it could be explained by neural networks, right? Um, it, but it's it's a very complex human activity, and I have not seen any technology that could help i mean so all these beautiful ui based systems where you automatically can do the mappings right they all work for the first 70 percent i'm not i don't even want to go to 80 right and then and you described it in your book too juan yeah and then always programming is involved in combinations of objects yeah and then if this is in the object then we want to go there and if this is an object we go there so suddenly yeah this beautiful tool that you built right then suddenly you have to add programming and you have to add JavaScript or Java or whatever else to your modeling, well, to your ATL tool, right? Um, and suddenly it's a very complicated thing. Yeah, and then you're back to programming anyway. So I'm I'm radically in favor of just use programming for um, for, for, for ETL, for data modeling. Actually, yeah. now, I'm, now I'm making a distinction between data modeling and ETL, but they're closely related, of course, right? I mean... Mm -hmm. Well, th so so this is an interesting aspect because when we think about ETL, right? Yeah. We we think about, I mean, now now we're seeing a lot of very popular the conversations around T, right? The the transformations. This is where DBT is and stuff. But at the end, I am moving something from a source to a target, but that target needs to be modeled. But somehow we don't talk. We like the modeling gets embedded in that transformation. Yeah, and, and that's and, and and the people and the people who are writing those transformations are they talking then to other people? I I mean this is this is the open question and this is what scares it scares me at the end of the day because you just have a bunch of models that are again it's hard right you want to go talk to the humans but nobody's talking to the humans they're just the and some of the engineers are writing these transformations so technically there is modeling going on but yeah. it's just this one person or these group pe people that are most probably, I'm going to bet, not talking to the end users. I'm hopefully wrong, but you know, I mean, it's very common. You see this stuff. People just do transformations and do these mappings, and they're not yeah. really talking to the end users. Well, so we at our company promote very hard this, this model of entity event modeling, right? Where most enterprise applications can be modeled as there's one very important entity and then almost everything that happens to or with that entity is is like a transaction something with a yeah with the temporal aspect to it right and that works for banks we've done a big use case in healthcare we're doing it in call centers and other places and it's always the same yeah you start with the model so let's take healthcare right and you have an enterprise data warehouse, you have data streams coming in, you have uh, HL7, fire streams coming in. And how do you model that all something that is very simple? So we just say radically simplify your model, right? You just have one entity, which is the person, say in, in healthcare, it would be the person. And then everything else becomes an event, right? So a diagnosis becomes an event, a test, a procedure, um, whatever else you can think of. And so in, in the healthcare application that we help with, uh, we have 350 types of events, yeah? where one event could be a diagnosis with again, 20,000 uh, uh, values for uh, an, an, an ICD-9 or ICD-10 code, but still just 350 core events. And so now in the hospital, they have an, a UI system where on the left-hand side, you do the the, the, the inspection of your relational databases, enterprise data warehouse, maybe other things. On the right hand side, you just have a drop downs with the 350 core events you can have. Yeah. And you can make a very easy mapping between the table 
and, and column in the relational database or in the well, in that other technology and then into uh, the knowledge graph. But the issue is the uh, the person that knows the knowledge graph can do it on his own. And the person that knows this, this relational databases or Epic or any of the other system can't do it on his own either. So basically what they found is they need a team of a, someone that knows these relational databases, someone that knows the, the data model of the knowledge graph and have them work together. Yeah. And they claim they can do about one table per 20 minutes. Yeah. In the case of healthcare. So does, does that make sense? Does that even answer your question? But the point is we, we dramatically simplified that, that modeling. Yeah, by just saying, well, everything is an event. It doesn't work always. Right? I know that I, I can give you a lot of examples where it doesn't work, but most enterprise uh, uh, applications, it does work, right? And then the modeling, you take away half the complexity, yeah, because the target, you started talking about your target ontology, uh, where well, you didn't use the word ontology, the target, right? And then it's just picking from all your columns and, and uh, what have you into that very simple model. And then you can use R to RML or anything else you want. Um, does that make sense? Or you guys look a little bit confused now? <laughs> no, I, I think I think we're thinking about what you're saying here, and it makes a lot of sense. And, and I think we're kind of digesting it a little bit. I don't know, Juan. Do you have any follow up questions to that? Yeah. Or... So, so, so it's interesting you're saying that you like an approach for modeling because I'm always thinking about how do we get people more to go model and 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 not. Because a concern I always have is people end up boiling the ocean. And they, what, that, what, you, what do you call modeling? What what is I mean? How do you define? Okay, modeling? Let's, just, okay. <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about semantics here. For me, the modeling is is being able to go define a schema, yeah. right? And that schema is something that is going to represent what uh, how the how an end consumer, a person, is actually going to be able to understand the data. And yeah. I think traditionally, what we what we've seen is that you create the models for the application and you think about it as the requirements for the application and you have like the conceptual model, which does represent kind of what the end users think about the world. But at the moment that that, that model turns into that physical schema, it's done, it's created to go support the application. And then you have this concept, which in physically gets, gets for, horizontally partitioned, vertically partitioned because of query workloads, whatever. And then that conceptual model gets completely disconnected from the physical model and that gets thrown away or just a PDF that's five years old, whatever. And then when somebody needs to go look at that database schema to understand what it means, there's a model in there, but what the heck does this mean, right? That's the application centric view of the data. And yeah. like, I want to be able to go create, I want to, ideally all of this should have been represented in a model that the end users could, could always access. Yeah. So I think that that's, this is all these different terms of models and, in an ideal, I think that's the cool thing about having graphs is that if you think about it, the graph, the way you would model things in a graph is actually the way you would go query that. And if you're doing it in a relational world, not, I mean, it could at, at, at stage one, but at some point you got so many things that you need to go optimize for that that's yeah. going to go, There's go usually focus other on other concerns. Data. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a big believer in Dave McGrom's data centric uh, approach, right? Um, I think, I think all of us. Think are yeah. here and I, I i always have dave McCombs <laughs> book right in front of me <laughs> yeah. data -centric revolution. It's, it's, it's probably behind me somewhere right <laughs> yeah i usually have mine too i have uh, some boring governance books over here instead though <laughs> all right well but um well that, that's the other thing that if for the the the, the main um knowledge graph we're building the the dream is always can we have only one data representation for any kind of analytics that you want to do right that is the ultimate dream not built for every query a new data mart or a new weird extension to your model but can i make one model for most of the queries that i need to do of course it doesn't always work but most of the time we can make it work yeah with the, do, with do the you, modeling um... that we do do you see the entity event model as being tied to that? Like when you think about data centric knowledge, you know, and and sort of entity event models, are these things connected in terms of you know your your data centric foundation might be based on this type of an approach? Um, well, I think yeah. Well, the answer is yes. That's easy, right? It's it's specifically built to support many different types of use cases. I will, although. When you look at our approach, the entity event model usually covers 90% of the data. 
and then there's ten percent of the data that is just impossible to shard or to yeah in healthcare it's it's the hundred eighty um, the hundred eighty uh, taxonomies and ontologies that we use right I mean mm -hmm. there's there's no way you can shard that so we have a model to deal with that in this in this approach um, and for almost every application I can come up with the ten percent that cannot be sharded right so you need to have a mix of entity event approach together with something that's more of what we traditionally call knowledge if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting. So and, and, yeah. now you're saying ninety percent of the things in the world that you think about, it's in ninety percent of that you can represent it through this uh, entity event model. Yeah. So can, can you everything that, everything that has bit? everything that has time in it, right? Everything that has time in it. Well, that right, that has the a good question is, does everything have time? Because maybe. Well. I mean, if again, if I look at the taxonomy chain in healthcare, right? There's no time, although sometimes okay. it should because something comes before something else. But now there's there there. But any other th interesting application in whether it's in healthcare, healthcare in telecom, in the bank industry, in in uh, call centers. I mean, everything that's interesting is something that's temporal, right? What happened? <laughs> everything is about what happened. And I think in every application that we do, that I see is, okay, can I predict the behavior of this entity. I mean, that's all we want, right? Is to predict the behavior. Is he going to buy something? Is he going to die? Uh, what is he going to say? Uh, mm -hmm. that's that's a lot of times, um, it's always about a lot of times entities have time, time aspects as well. Like, right. Like a customer, yeah. but a customer when they, they were a customer starting from this date and then they stopped being a customer at that date. Yeah. Right? I, I, yeah. I remember working on this is like, you, you, you can ask these philosophical questions, right? Is this, is, is the one of today, the same one of yesterday, right? Well, uh... not not in the hospital because what we see is that people change their name, they change their social security name, they change their gender, definitely change their weight, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> even change their length. I mean, it's 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 unbelievable. Even you, what you think are properties change over time. I mean, okay, so and, what we... and of course because th that gets too expensive for querying, so we have the trace of 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 measurements or or when we established that this was your name but in theory we can always go back in history to all every previous gender you had right i mean or whatever <laughs> yeah I, I love what dean is saying here is is so true you can never step in the same river twice yeah here like yeah. this right but i mean yeah, yeah it's very co confusing to look at these at these questions at the same time that i'm looking at you and trying to listen <laughs> <laughs> a lot of multitasking right, right? yeah <laughs> What, we've been talking a lot about this event, entity event model, but we haven't really described it. Can you can you give us your kind of definition or explain how that works? Um, and that with words, right? Well, with words. <laughs> if you need a so, gesture or something like that, that's fine. Okay. To begin with, <laughs> when I think about, I've completely given up about thinking triples as just being triples. I think. In the old, fa old fashioned AI frame based systems, right? The early version of object oriented systems where an object is just a set of triples with the same subject. Yeah. And we actually call them a set of triples. But I, I, th I really, really think in terms of objects to begin with, right? So now, what is what are the events that I talk about? So let's take healthcare. Yeah. So I might have an inpatient encounter. Yeah, so I'm going to the hospital and I check in and then say four hours later or 40 days later, I check out, right? That was one event. Now that event is an object with a start time, an end time and a type, and then a few other key value pairs that might describe the event. But the event also has sub events, right? Yeah, I went to this specialist, right? And then this specialist did this particular diagnosis. So the diagnosis is an event, yeah, mm -hmm. where again, Usually you don't have an end time. It's just this is the time of this particular diagnosis, and then you get a, something prescribed, yeah, or you got a particular procedure. But again, the symptom, the procedure, or the medication order are just again objects with this, a, a time, not always an end time and a type, yeah, and some key value pairs. But the shape of the object is always the same. It, uh, the same. It's an object with a type, a start time, end time. And a few other things that make that event a little bit more different, but the shape is always the same. That simple object. 
and you look at it also as a as a temporal object in the hospital in the bronx they use multiple uh enterprise data warehouses because they bought up eight hospitals over time so you can you imagine the chaos that that gives but in just one enterprise data warehouse they have 250 ways to describe time yeah they have the inpatient encounter begin time and the inpatient encounter end time right and so it's fairly systematic but still a human being has to remember 250 ways that you think about time if you have the entity event model you can be guaranteed that there's a start time and there's an end time yeah or or not an end time but you there's always a, a begin time that makes it really simple there's always a type yeah and then based on what kind of event you have th there will be some other properties but is is this a natural again i'm using this word natural the natural way of thinking about things because you I mean you always give the example you have a customer places an order order has an order line order line has a product right a, 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 an order was shipped to an like so yeah. that's that's how we all think about it. that's how you're drawing the whiteboard you you, you take your business yeah. users they put they understand that well so in a call center right you try to sell you have what, what in, we had to decide what is the entity that we really care about well that's the the customer you're trying to sell to yeah so a call center might work for big clients like Oracle, Cisco, uh, Amazon trying to sell cloud services, right? They do campaigns that last a certain amount of time. We're trying to sell something and then ultimately sales agents sell something to the the cust to the, the to the end users, right? That you want to sell to. Ultimately we decide that the end user is the one you want to everything know about, right? So that is the core entity. And then every interaction with that customer whether you sell something, whether you got an appointment with them, whatever interaction you can imagine, that became the event, right? But the, and then we, we start with that, and then there will be, again, the 10% that you can't chart, yeah? And we put that into a, a knowledge base and we federate these event charts with these knowledge bases. And that model works for a call center. It works for a bank uh, that we work with. Um, it, it worked in healthcare. Right now, I'm working for, uh, uh, with the FAA, right? And we have uh, we're looking at um, uh, maintenance and uh, incidents and all kinds of other things that happen to aircraft, right? Easy. The aircraft is the um, the, the core entity, and then everything, every maintenance, every incident, every repair, every inventory with respect to an aircraft becomes an event can be attached to the core entity. And again, I can do prediction of behavior. That's all like, so in every application that I see it, that our customers work at, the only thing people care about is what is my entity going to do next? And what's going to happen to my entity, right? So, yeah. What is it done? What is it what doing? Is it done? What, will, what will it do, right? Can I, can I understand the behavior? Yeah. Can yeah. I classify the behavior? Can I really understand why? What is the causality in this? You, I mean, we're, the, everything human beings do is trying to figure out, okay, why, right? What is the, what is the cause? What, what causes what, right? And so if you don't have a series, if you can't look at your data as a series of events, you never can say anything about causality. You can only say something about maybe correlation. So entity event modeling is yeah. something that... I'm sort of familiar with it at a high level, but not deeply. Um, so I appreciate you kind of going into it more and, and kind of showing off that it can go into, you know, different industries and different use cases. Um, one of the, one of the things that I wonder, right? So like my background, obviously, you know, I'm, 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 I'm learning about and getting stronger and sort of graph and knowledge graph and things like that. But my background is much more in sort of the relational and then sort of the big data world. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, is is entity event modeling? Does it have uh, applicability or corollaries in sort of the relational world too? Like what? And what would that be? Like, do, do you look at things like time series databases, or you know, you know, that's not necessarily relational. Like event modeling. You know, you think about like CDPs and you know, you know, trying to yeah. event. You know, do marketing and, and customer oriented events and things like that in a in a data warehouse. You know, are those concepts similar or are they different? And kind of curious if for the re more relationally minded people, you know, how do you how do you compare those things? Yeah, I, I can't. There's a wonderful article uh, that I found on the Internet that I sometimes show in talks about the difference between 
regular modeling and event-based modeling in relational databases. You can do the same thing in relational database, right? You can, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. nothing special actually. Um, and the person that describes it says, well, if you don't do the regular modeling, then you always know what the state of the system is, but you don't know how you got there. And if you use an entity and an, an, an event approach, then you know how you got there, you got there. But if you want to know the current state, right? Then you might have to do a lot of extra computation to actually figure out so, yeah, what is my current state given everything that happened so mm -hmm. if you do that approach then you have to do a lot of work to kind of classify the current state of of your patient customer or whatever else right so that's the trade-off so yeah. counting what, what, ca counting is super hard right so it may so i want to count how many patients i have yeah it's easier in one and harder in the other or, or? Yeah, relational, a traditional relational database can instantly tell you the state of your inventory. Yeah, but if you would the inventory do, only do through everything coming in and going out, right? Then you actually would have to count unless you spend a, extra, a little bit of extra time with the trigger or anything else to actually compute how much you actually have right now. Um, does that does that make sense? So it's just two different approaches. Yeah, but if you are interested. Yeah, not in the current state, but what is my entity going to do next, right? Or what's going to happen to my entity? Well, then you better keep everything that happened so far. Now, Juan, you brought up another interesting topic is in time series databases. Well, um, TimeDB and other. So this, this is another thing that I see as a future of knowledge graphs, right? And something we're also working on. Because if you have thousands of events per entity and then doing a Sparkle query, right? Like, find someone that first had this diabetes and then he got this particular procedure and then he used this particular medication and then he went really bad, right? Now you have to look over 2 million patients trying to do this series and that really is very slow. So you really have to do and shard your data and create specialized indices for temporal data, right? Otherwise you can't do your queries really well. But even then, Oh, so that is the one end. That is the problem with with uh, with uh, graph databases and temporal data, right? That uh, if you put it all in one big graph database, then and you do very complex temporal queries, then you better make sure that you optimize your queries for that and your technology for that. And then you have the people that say, well, why don't I put everything in a in time time DB, right? In a and, and temporal database. The problem with temporal database, there's actually just one big matrix, right? It's just like a pandas, but then in a database. And certain things work really well, but the problem is I could look at a series of events for one patient, but that one patient shares the same doctor, the department where he was, the medications, the drugs, the, the medical treatment. So this, it, even if it's a long series of events, it's still a very, very complex graph because of all the interconnections that you have, right? Does that make sense? So the... Yeah, no, no. This is you're you're, you're making me uh, think and connect a lot of the dots of a past conversation we've had with uh, with Emil, right, the CEO from Neo4j, um, couple couple weeks ago here in the podcast. Um, I'm going to hold that question for our lightning round, but um, I I I, I want to shift a little bit gears and go back into how do we get started? So the the the, the for for folks who are not thinking about data Starting modeling, with just with data modeling, I, I think I oh, think okay. that we are always doing some sort of data modeling. It's just not explicit, or it's not a first class citizen. Um, let, let, let me let me let me let me start with that. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I I I I've observed that a lot, right? The people who eventually do it. It's implicit in some stuff. Do you agree with that, or you think that it always does happen explicitly, but it, just a small amount of people know about it? Or what are your thoughts? Well, as soon as you put anything in any kind of database, you do data modeling, right? <laughs> the the thing is, do people know I, that? Do they even know what they're doing? Because this is, this well, is okay, okay, okay. So I recently wrote, well, I was interviewed by someone and uh, I talked about that we never get phone calls from people under 35. And then the interviewer made it look like that I didn't like to work with young people. But I mean, that's the most wonderful thing in my life is to actually work with young people. But if you ask someone in an enterprise, 
yeah, a group of programmers. Hey, I need to solve this problem, right? Here's uh, solve it for me. The people say, oh, what is the coolest graph database on the planet right now? Oh, that is this one. All right. So um, where's the data? Oh, let me just put the data from here and there in this particular uh, graph database. And within three months, I have something that solves the problem. Everyone happy, right? The programmer, he delivered on time, gets a raise. The manager happy because his manager asked him to solve a problem and now he solved it. But the issue is no one thought in this entire process about, oh, but how do I, does this solve something for the entire enterprise? Yeah, there were, let me say it different. There was no data centric thinking anywhere along the process, right? There was, But if you believe in data centric uh, processing, a, a data centric architecture for your company, you better think really, really hard about your data model, right? So again, if you don't care about data centric modeling, a data centric architecture, then you can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter, right? You can solve the problem. Any young, young programmer, and all programmers too, by the way, yeah, can solve a problem. It's just fun. Like there's nice programming, yeah. like a, a little bit of hacking, and and everyone happy, yeah. But if you want to do da the data centric approach, then you get people. I see Dean here, and well, I see some other people here. I mean, then data modeling becomes almost the most important thing, right? Let's do. Let's fix it for the entire enterprise for every new application that ever ever gonna need, right? I want to have a data model that really works. Does it make sense? That is the yeah, that's the core. So, so yeah. I mean, I see, but I see everything. I see. I, I, yeah, actually, so Rodney here is now pointing out it's it's if you if you focus just on the applications and then it ends up being this point to point solution. I created this application and eventually to go talk to this other one. You're just doing all these point to point things. And and I think also uh, if if yeah if you if all your if your goal is to just focus on this one particular problem and I just need to go solve it, then yeah, you're probably not going to think about that sophisticated modeling and how that's going to uh, be able to go reused for other use cases and stuff. But if you really want to start thinking in your for your organization, if I'm going to put some energy and and time and spend money on on doing on creating data that and I want that to be reusable, I need to start talking to other people to figure out what how are they thinking about the world, how how this could how could this possibly be reused. So it's this it's this balance what I was talking about of I need to be efficient, but at the same time I want to go do work that can enable a resilient. Uh, organization knowing that I can support known use cases, but also hopefully unknown use cases I have no idea about. Yeah. I think this is, and, and I think if, if 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 you are focused, if you want to be resilient in your organization, you should really be thinking about data modeling from the beginning. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but there's also a balance that you don't want to go boil the ocean, right? And then just spend all the time doing data models because we see that time and time again. It's like, well, you just spend a lot of time and all you have to go show is these really complicated boxes and lines and this UML, a big sheet of paper. And yeah. How, how do we avoid, you know, this becoming just this effort to achieve perfection yeah. and the sort of never getting there, right? Because we know that's an impossible destination, right? How, how do you... I mean, obviously, graph helps, right? But like, how do we how do we approach this graph or not? Well, I think this has been figured out for for healthcare. I think, right? My uh, my colleague Parsi Mihaji and in Montefiore came up with this event model for healthcare, and that is a I mean, yeah, I, I mean, if I look at that list of all the particular kinds of events you can have, you could maybe event more events, but that that's it, right? That's a, that's a series of things. But for a bank, right, then, um, well, I mean, you should really invite uh, uh, um, someone from Wells Fargo or Dean here and, and talk about, has Dean already been here? He actually had so we've actually had Dean as a guest before. Uh, we've actually had uh, Dave McComb also as a guest. Yeah, about yeah. So David I think Newman. They should, you should invite David Newman because he's he's trying to do this for the bank, right? Okay, what are the core objects independent of any IT system that I have? What are the core objects for my bank, right? And then he starts with that. And you don't have to fill in every attribute, yeah. As long as you got eighty percent of that attribute right, you got a good start. 
but i mean tim it's a good question it's always the balance between yeah to total a total perfect model but you didn't know what you were going to use it for to uh, uh this this quick hack right that solved the problem right and so yeah that's well, the difficulty I, I like the here's a linkedin user which i'm gonna guess it's mark kitson because he's a guy who hasn't uh he has some privacy issues on his LinkedIn account. That's why the name doesn't show up when we see it here. But he just said perfection per use case. There is no universal perfection unless you've boiled the ocean. Um, I, 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 I agree with that comment. So, but does that mean that you disagree with me? And, and if, if so, what is it what you would disagree with? All right, Mark or LinkedIn user, if you're listening, <laughs> the answer. But hey, so let's let's let, let's take it let, let's take it to the to the to the next uh, segment here, our lightning yeah. rounds. Uh, so we got we got some uh, yes or no questions for you. So, oh, we're already uh, two forty five. Oh, that went fast. I, 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 we could keep talking here for a long time, for a long time. Right? So, all right, um, knowledge graphs will make data modeling become sexy and a topic of conversation. Yes or no? Yes. All right. Here's the next one. Data modeling will become something that business users can do. Yes. Yes or no? Yes. Mm. Ah. So um, another one. Emil from Neo4j, who was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, mentioned about time series, new SQL, uh, graphs, and document uh, plus plus as the four main database types. Uh, will this entity event model and the data centric architecture overlay on all of that? Yeah. Wow. Very, very, very specific here. Can, can, I want to break the lightning round here for a second and say, can you add, can you add a sentence to that? Uh, Emil is uh, quoting from a Gartner report that, well, not quoting. I mean, he probably helped him influence that, but, <laughs> but, uh, there was a very interesting Gartner article where someone um, argued that business always go to flexibility, right? That's why MongoDB was such a great success. Um, right? That's probably why graph databases. And he said, ultimately, the only databases left standing in 50 years time will be something like a graph database and a document database. And because time is so important, a time database, that's it, mm -hmm. yeah? But if you think that evolution is going along the line of flexibility, then that would be the ultimate answer. Yeah, relational databases are not the answer to flexibility, right? We probably all agree. And so a combination of time series document and um, uh, uh, graphs is probably the kind of database you're gonna see. That gives you the, the, the three key tools you need and then layer on your knowledge graph on top, right? Yeah, yeah. This is making me, we, we need to have another discussion or another topic on these multi-model databases that apparently say they can do all that. We need to go figure that one out. That's going to be an interesting, uh, honest, no BS discussion on, do we need to have four different databases or just, uh, just one that rules them all. So, uh, well, the, but, I mean, all right. Document well, and graph is easy, but document and time, that's going to be a little bit yeah. more har harder work. <laughs> yeah, some of these things hey, are graph, a little... Graph and, te and temporal, that's hard work. A little harder to reconcile some yeah, of these yeah. things, right? Um, All right, Tim, you broke the lightning Maybe that's round, okay. Right? All right, last, last question. One. All right, every data team should be talking more about their data model. Yes or no? Uh, yes. That was an easy one, but we want to reinforce it. <laughs> yeah, but, right. Data so, teams, but, talk about your data model. All right. So, so th this is Tim and I have been. We always do our takeaways, and we got a lot of notes here. So, T T T. Tim, take it away with take it away with takeaways. <laughs> take it away. Here we go. Let's take it away. All right. So, um, I like that you said modeling is human problem solving. I yeah. think that sometimes people think of modeling as some sort of a technical challenge or something that only very special people can talk about and implement. And I think thinking of modeling as human problem solving is a great framework. I, I look forward to, to using that uh, as we go forward here. Uh, and I, I really like that you talked about don't start with top down logical models. Uh, instead, really take a bottoms up approach. And you said, what are the top 10 questions you want to answer? 
right? And and how do you sort of start in a specific domain and work your way sort of across that way, right? And uh, I think these are really good points. I mean, you know, we've talked about not boiling the ocean in the context of sort of analytics and the context of governance, but it applies to sort of the world of of modeling in 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 in, in much the same way. And it's a very important approach. It's it's amazing how how many legs that phrasing really has. What what about you, Juan? Well, so the main, main takeaway is entity event modeling. Like this is something that we really need to start thinking more about, right? Uh, at the end of the day, we our goal is we want to understand the behavior of that entity, that thing that my business cares the most about. And that's not just something static. That's something about everything that's happened about it because I want to be able to predict that behavior. Um and then this, you're very, I'm, I'm taking this, uh, another interesting takeaway is this 90-10 rule, right? You said that for all 90, 90% of the self, you can go work with the entity event approach. And the rest is around the knowledge, is around the knowledge and you can have this other knowledge base around it. So that, that, that was a very interesting uh, comment there that I'm actually going to need to start looking more into that and, and, and see. I, I, I trust that it, you're right. It's 90%. I just never thought about it that way. I want to start thinking about it more. And the other one is, what we were saying of kind of connecting it with a lot that I talk about the efficiency versus resilience about, Hey, if your goal is just to go something very quickly, you'll probably, I mean, I, I, first of all, you always do data modeling. I mean, if you put, you're working with data, you always do some sort of data modeling, but if you're just doing something very efficient, very quickly and go solve the problem, you're not spending any energy and you're not focusing on that data model and okay, you solve that problem, but that's not going to be easily reusable. Um, but if you want to go, if, if your goal is to be resilient, your goal is to be able to go invest, to make sure that I have good ROI on my investments of the data I'm doing, you need to start thinking about data modeling because that's how you're really going to be thinking of generating a resilient infrastructure and a resilient organization. Um, so I think th this is, uh, if you are spending time on data modeling, you are on the path to be resilient. If you are not spending time on data modeling, you're being efficient. It's not a bad thing, but you're probably not being resilient. And depending who you are on your what type of organization you are, that's the balance that you're trying to go figure out. So that, that was a very interesting uh, takeaway for me. And I'll throw it back to you, Jan. So our final segment of advice. One, what's your advice? And second, about data, life, whatever. And second, who should we invite next? That, how many questions was that? What's your advice? Who should oh. we invite next? <laughs> Uh, my advice is if you're in a particular domain and you're overwhelmed with information that is extremely diverse, then think about building a knowledge graph. C can I add a little bit of color to that? This, I'm, I'm, I talked this weekend to two different people that are in completely different domains. Um, that both never had heard of a knowledge graph, by the way. That was, uh, so we all think in this audience, oh, knowledge graph, knowledge graph. But I mean, most people have no clue what you talk about, right? One wants them looking at climate change and how can you create a new world where people divest their money from oil and gas companies and put it into other things, right? How do it in such a way that, that the big companies will access to, uh, accept it, how big investors will accept it? And I talked about, so where do you get your knowledge? Where do you store successful policies and, and all of that? And she said, well, everywhere, and it's so hard to find. And so I had to explain what a knowledge graph was, right? <laughs> and another guy uh, talked about, uh, he's doing um, economics research in psychedelics in healthcare, right? How, how can you use psychedelics instead of other medications? And again, he was having like, 12 spreadsheets where I was trying to keep things together. I said, Jans, I can't do it anymore. And so I had to give a whole lecture about knowledge graphs to him uh, and how I could help him with that. So it was kind of a fun discussion. But yeah, I see so many places now where a, a knowledge graph would help, right? Both cases, by the way, were not really entity event models. That Those were more like static knowledge, wh where is what and how, right? More knowledge bases. So that is my, uh, yeah, and then my advice. God, um, I'm, I'm really, really deeply concerned about the uh, political divide in this world, right? And so I always have to think about the Dalai Lama, right? Uh, kindness is my religion, so please be kind. <laughs> Love that. Please That's be it. kind. <laughs> please and be who kind. should we invite next? Uh, 
David Newman from Wells Fargo, maybe, or Parsa Mihaji from uh, Montefiore Hospital, or Shannon Copeland it's in, in the world of uh, uh, um, uh, call centers, but a big, big fan of knowledge graphs. And all of three of them, right, are in a particular domain and, and really committed to, uh, to the world of knowledge graphs. But again, yeah, there's so many people in our domain now that you can talk to, right? <laughs> That's true. I think I think uh, yeah, I think David David Newman would probably be the best. Uh, if if Dean didn't already cover everything that uh, that David is doing. <laughs> well, Jans, this has been a fantastic conversation and uh, in a philosophical, uh, practical, so many different aspects. Thank you so much. We really appreciate right. it. Well, Cheers and this is a quick quick reminder, uh, the data.world summit is next week is September 29th. It's a free virtual event with awesome presenters, including us. Tim and I will be there. Our agenda has a lot of the folks who have actually been on the podcast. So Shamak Degani, Dean Alamang, Bar Moses, uh, Doug Laney, who will be a guest pretty soon. We're going to be talking about data mesh, data ops, data product managers, data governance, knowledge graphs. And if you enjoy cataloging cocktails, you're going to enjoy our data.world summit, which is also a honest, no BS approach of how we do our summit. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for your time and, and to data modeling. Yeah, Cheers. It, all right. And is, be is, kind. Yes, and be kind. And be kind. <laughs> and hope to see you in Austin in January. Hopefully, Great. yes. Hopefully. <laughs> all right.